And I think we're recording now. Uh, you should also be seeing a screen that I'm sharing about the Microsoft PowerPoint uh, that I have set up. Um, I usually use that just to give me a little bit of structure of what I'm talking about and keep me uh, more oriented. So uh, I, I like to share that with you but I do typically jump around a little bit from different uh, screens to another, but um, you should be able to see that at this time. So can you believe we're well on our way now of uh, approaching the very last part of the semester? So a huge congratulations to you. I think that doing these accelerated courses is a feat on its own and to do well on that that's basically you're doing whole semester's worth of work in just a few weeks so uh, please keep on mind that what you're accomplishing is outstanding and that's something that I sometimes encourage my students that when you're writing uh, job applications or personal statements it is worth of saying that uh, you've proven yourself in terms of how to handle high fast faced uh, material in, in an extreme setting by doing these accelerated courses. So uh, awesome job. I did have a little bit of a plan uh, for today. I was going to say a couple of words about where we we're at with the course and then talk a few words about that field trip that I offer uh, as an optional thing, I think it's next Tuesday. Uh, however, as I mentioned it even now, I want to make sure that everyone is clear that that is not required. It's just an optional thing that I like to offer to my students, but by no means is there an expectation, is there pressure uh, to attend. Uh, you will not be losing out on something in terms of this course your grade will not be negatively impacted if you're not able to come so please 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 uh, know that it's just an extra thing that i wanted to make available what i also was want to do wanting to do today is kind of get us oriented so far we've covered quite a lot of material on this course we've had a look of the skin we've had a look of the structures associated with this skin, we've talked about the skeletal system, and we've talked about muscular system. And really, this week marks us moving to one of the, or to the very last big chunk, I guess that you could call it a unit of the course, and that's going to be nervous system. So I wanted to say a couple of words to get us thinking about that. As always, I wanted to kind of give a reminder of what's to come in terms of the homework, uh, what I'm looking for, and then review the chapter material, kind of give a nutshell version of the two chapters that I asked you to look at this week. Uh, I want to leave room and time if someone feels that it would be helpful to review the homework, we can totally do that, but that's not something that I normally have done because it seems like most students are really well, got, have gotten a hang of it and feel, feel kind of comfortable with that. I want to make time also for any questions at the end, but as always, at any stage, feel free to just jump in. If you have a question, uh, don't hesitate. I don't want you to hold on to that question and feel that you can't ask it and then be like, oh, darn, I forgot it, or it's hard to look back to that. So just unmute yourself and shout out or drop it to the chat or whatever other means you can think of uh, if if you have questions as they come up. Uh, I'm very much of uh, thinking that these sessions are what the students want out of them. Uh, so I don't have anything. This is my plan, but I don't have any uh, commitment to it in a sense that I wouldn't be willing to change it around. I really want these sessions to be useful for you. So the very first thing that I wanted to say is that I realize how hard you worked. Last week was very intense since you covered your 
uh, two chapters and you in addition to that covered your second exam and second practical and i think that those weeks when we have those food for thoughts activities are always quite a lot to do also in terms of the homework so i really really do appreciate all the great work that you put in uh, like i said I try to listen very carefully students and I've taken a lot of things on board from those midterm feedbacks and I, I realize that it is really intense what you're doing and at the same time uh, I'm kind of battling that balance that we're going to try to cover in eight weeks something or all of the material that we would normally cover in 16 weeks so it is a little bit faster phased but the fact that you're doing it is a testament of your uh, amazing skills of navigating the time, navigating the workload and, and so on. So that's why I just wanted to take a moment to tell you that I realize, I recognize the work you're putting in. I really do carefully read everything you sent to me and monitor that. And the answers that you're sending in are amazing. Everyone who's on this call at this time, I recognize the names, I know you're writing, uh, and I'm, I'm very, very appreciative of you. And same goes for those students who are gonna watch this recording. Uh, please know that I, I do take great uh, care of reading your assignments, reading your comments, reading your thoughts, and I appreciate all the amazing work that you're submitting. So kind of this is looping back to what I was starting with. You might recognize this slide from very early days when we met. I think on the first week I used this slide. I've just colored it a little differently, but uh, it outlines everything that we're doing on this course and uh, as you saw we've covered already quite a bit of material i think that the uh, first week we looked at some of the general language and uh, regions and directional terms and then the second week was very intense when we kind of reviewed it was bio 181 on steroids we reviewed everything that's essential for you to remember from that uh, then we did spend time to talk about skin associated structures and looked at the bone on a general level, took our first exam, took our first practical, and uh, finished the skeletal system and articulations. Uh, last week, we spent time looking at the muscle tissue and the big skeletal muscles of your body, and also did the exam too, and practical too. That was a lot. Uh, we've gotten really, really far. So the only very last thing we have left for this semester is to talk about nervous system. And I've broken nervous system into a few different sections just to make it more manageable. I think that often it's helpful to approach these things uh, by breaking them apart. So today, or this week, we're looking kind of a general introduction to nervous system, and we'll talk a little bit about central nervous system. And then in the coming weeks that we've still got left, we'll talk about the rest of the nervous system, as well as special senses. Just give me a second, I've got a cat who's been by herself uh, all week, who's really desperate for attention. Do you want to come up? You can go up there. So, um, that's the plan, and as you see, the very last exam and very last practical are going to be focused on the nervous system. So, I think I mentioned this before, but I just want to be super clear. There is no cumulative final exam for this course. It's simply once you get through the material and you've taken the exam, that's the last time you see that material. So, uh, we are going to be uh shifting our focus on the nervous system the nervous system is really really important for any of the allied health carriers that you might be heading to so we'll spend quite a bit of time on that because really i think that most of the things that you'll see in the human body are going to be related to that so that was that kind of a general intro spill to what's happening uh, i did want to take a few moments to talk about that field trip so um, I 
had a lot of students this semester who were really, really curious about other careers than just nursing. And a lot of students who were really pursuing these courses to get into the nursing program. And during some of our discussions, uh, those discussions took us to talk about the fact that um, I've taught in many, many different institutions, and this is one of the few institutions where we don't have human catheters available for our anatomy and physiology students. And that doesn't mean that you're losing out on things, but it's just a different way of learning. I think that there's some value in having those real catheters because you get to see that individual variation and you get to do a little bit more uh, hands-on learning and uh, appreciation of three-dimensionality of a lot of, lot, of, lot of structures that we talk about. And this is not only a thing for our uh, online classes, it's the same for our face-to-face -face classes that we don't use catheters in this college. So for that reason, uh, students are often very, very curious that what would it be like to see human catheters? And I have two different options uh, at different stages. Um, I do have good contacts in other institutions uh, that whenever they're doing cavateric work, I usually extend those invitations to my students. Uh, same goes also if there's chances to uh, visit body donation centers and so on. But one thing that we do in this college is that we do have a mortuary science program. And I think, and don't uh, quote me on this, uh, this is not something that I'm very ver well versed on, but I think it's one of the few or if the only accredited mortuary science degree here in Arizona. So it's kind of a big deal. And um, I do a lot of stuff with our mortuary science program. Folks, they're amazing people. And um, one of the things that they use in their training is synthetic cavaters. So it's not real human bodies, but it's human bodies that are made of synthetic materials such as plastics and so on uh, that can be dissected and cut and opened and studied as you would study an actual human being. So my students were really curious about these synthetic cavaters, and I was like, well, maybe we should go and see them. And that's exactly what we're doing on the next week's Tuesday, which I believe is the 11th. So I've organized a kind of a series of things that we're going to visit. Uh, we'll start by checking in with our campus, uh, Williams campus, uh, you probably might have been before at the Pecos campus, which is our main campus. And then we have Williams campus, uh, which is actually where I'm based and where my offices are and where all of our nursing program and mortuary science and other other programs related to that, including aviation program is. Um, and um, I thought that let's let's have a look of the campus. Let's see what other options we have there. I think they train EMTs and uh, firefighters and all kinds of things. So I've called, cashed in a lot of favors so we get to visit as many of those. I don't know exactly who are uh, yet facilitating us for that whole campus tour that what things we'll see. But one of the big things where we'll spend time is with our mortuary science program folks. Um, I also, like I said, do a lot of stuff with our nursing program. So I wanted to make sure that we get to peek in and spend a little bit of time on their simulation labs. So you see what's to come if you're aiming for that career and we'll finish the day by checking out what the library has to offer. Um, all of this takes place at the Williams campus, like I mentioned, and uh, sometimes I get students who have never been to Williams campus. So the easy landmark for that is that it's right next to the Gateway Airport. So literally on the other side of the road. My office looks at the tarmac of the uh, Gateway Airport. So uh, it literally is, is a very, very, very close. And I'm going to jump out of this view because I want to show you the announcement that I shared with you. Uh, I did update it a little bit because I noticed that I hadn't done a great job of uh, uploading a PDF version of what I wanted to show. 
So let's see. Here's the announcement that I was talking about. Um, we are going to go for this trip on Tuesday, July 11th. Uh, I'm asking that students make their own way to the Williams campus where we will meet at 8 o'clock. Typically, the Williams campus is a little bit of tricky to navigate because it's I would say part of ASU campus, but that's probably not a real dis or proper description. We're uh, kind of blended in uh, right next to the ASU campus. And I think ASU charges a fair bit from their students for parking every semester. We don't charge anything, so we sometimes have a little bit of a battle that we find uh, people parking at the parking lots who are either traveling somewhere from airport or they are ASU st students. And for that reason, our campus police is usually very, very careful of making sure that only our students park there. But I've cut some deals with them and they've, they've promised to uh, make sure that you can park there and not get into any trouble. Um, so for that reason, I'm asking you to park to a very specific part of the campus, just to make sure that you're well taken care of and nothing, uh, nothing happens that can cause trouble. So um, I have this little map on the uh, announcement that I made, and I now uploaded it also as a PDF file, so you can kind of pull up this flyer. And on that little map, let's have a look of that a little more. Uh, you can see this uh, sketch of the where the Williams campus is located in relation to the airport and where I'm asking you to park. And you'll also see that there's a link that opens a bigger map where I cut off uh, this, these instructions. So uh, most students come from Power Road, which is here uh, on the side of the uh, map and then end up to the Sossaman Road, which kind of arches and heads towards the uh, Gateway Airport, which would be somewhere here. So uh, if you take any of these turns and head to the parking lot that's labeled as a parking lot 94, there's going to be plenty of place for you to park there and you don't need to have a a uh, parking permit or anything like that. I've, I've worked with the police. They will take care of that. You're well taken care of and you don't have to worry. So uh, if you just use the Avery's every street and innovation way as your corners and find your way to the parking lot 94, that would be a great place to leave the car. And then you just make your way from there to the Bridget Hall building, Bridget Hall, BRID is a big glass building and right at the end of the Bridget Hall, uh, where, which, where my cursor at the moment is, we're going to find our highly rope. Higley Room and uh, Higley Room uh, is where we will meet. Uh, if you ask from anyone, they will guide you there. You will not have a hard time finding there. So we'll start our day uh, at that part of the building, and then then uh, we'll we've got these other visits lined up. At the moment, uh, it looks like that you don't need to sign up. You just simply show up to the day. Uh, there are some things that I always try to be very careful in terms of insurance issues and so on. Uh, but I think that we should be pretty good with that. If there's any changes and if I require registration, I will let you know. But at the moment, uh, the thinking is that you just show up on the day uh, if you want to show up. I will be also uh, making sure that I'll be sharing my contact details in case you have any trouble finding your way there. Um, I can come and meet you if you're running a little bit behind. But I would ask you to show up for 8 o'clock uh, on Tuesday if you want to take part on this trip. Uh, I'm expecting that we finish before 11 o'clock, so that gives you an idea of the timeline for the day. Oh, I'm very, very glad that you were able to join us for a bit. Um, what I will do, I will jump back to share another screen um, or the original screen that I had there. Um, like I said, I will be sharing more details on the canvas if there's anything about the field trip, but it really is just a 
fun little thing. I don't want you to stress about it if you're not able to come. But if you're able to come, I promise that I've cashed in all of my favors and pulled all the stops to make it a really, really fun day uh, that gives you an idea to check out if you're pursuing nursing program, what they're doing in their classes, or if you want to see other fields uh, that you can chase after. I think mortuary science, if I was a student again, uh, I would definitely be interested on that. That's kind of a cool field and they do some amazing stuff. So that promises to be a great day. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that? Well, in that case, I'm just going to keep going because I'm mindful of the time and we can loop back to that. Uh, I've done these kind of uh, little self care check ins uh, so before, but I'll just go through this really quickly. I picked a random page on a book that I've been losing re using recently to kind of uh, get talking points for my classes and uh, on that book. The little poem that came up was, I closed my eyes to look inward and found a universe waiting to be explored. And I thought that that's a really relevant, actually, to what we're talking about when we're talking about nervous system. And the reason why I think it's really relevant when we're talking about nervous system is that obviously every specialist on medicine will give you different answers when you ask what's the most important part of the body. But this is one way to look at it that this is all you are. Here on the screen, you should be seeing a picture of a human nervous system. So we have our brain, spinal cord, and the nerves running. And really everything that you've ever seen, everything you've ever smelled, heard, tasted, felt, every thought, every dream, every joy, every sadness, is really simply a creation of your nervous system. So I think that that was kind of a nice uh, bridge to our topic that we're, we're moving on. So that's why really it is so important that we spend some time talking about the nervous system. And nervous system is actually not fully understood yet. There's a lot of research that's going on and there's a lot of things we're uh, figuring out. And that happens to be true in, for the whole human body. Actually, not too many years ago, we identified a whole new organ in the human body that we did. We kind of knew that it existed, but we hadn't really formally identified it. So that just shows that there's still a lot of work to be done. But I think that, that, that the nervous system especially is is especially interesting in that sense. Uh, the kind of building from that, the homework that we have for this week is a little lighter, you'll be glad to know. I'm simply asking you to do quizzes and practice anatomy activity for both of the two chapters that we we're covering. So we're covering chapter 12, which is more of a general intro, and chapter 14, which is focused on the central nervous system. And uh, those assignments, they, they will carry points towards your final grade, and I'm asking you to try to get them submitted by the end of the week. Um, I know that since it's been such a busy time, a lot of students have been like, oh, there's a lot to do, and we had all kinds of celebrations and all kinds of things. So if you missed any due dates, if there's anything that you really still want to submit and you didn't get a chance to do, or you feel that you didn't do to your normal standard, I'm happy to have those discussions on a case by case basis. So drop me a message. Let's figure out. I want you to walk away from this course feeling that you had a chance to show everything you wanted to show. So this is a good week to get caught up on all of those things. Obviously, I ask you to still do the homework as well. So that's the plan for the week. And what I was going to do at this point of the uh, session that we have together was to go through the kind of a review of the uh, two chapters, the chapter 12 and chapter 14. Um, does anyone have any questions before I jump into those? Seems like everyone's doing well. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to jump into those and I'm going to give kind of like a, like I said, a nutshell 
a description of all the key things that you need to know about these two chapters. Obviously, there's a little bit more to this story. Obviously, uh, there's more to discuss. Uh, there's more detail and those materials, the pre-recorded lectures, your textbook, the activities that you'll be doing will help with those. But I want to give at least a kind of a general idea of what to pay attention from that material uh, during this session. So without further ado, uh, again, you should be seeing my screen and I uh, made it full size because I feel when we're going through these discussions, there's a couple of things that I want to do, draw to the screen and so on. So it works a little bit better. So what I wanted to start with was to really discuss how fascinating system and nervous system is. Um, I really often say that brain is the most complex organ that we have. And uh, some of my own background includes study of psychology and neurosciences. Uh, I ended up specializing on cardiac uh, imaging, medical imaging of the heart. But uh, I really do think that heart is the second most fascinating organ in the body and the nervous system and the brain still remains as the, one of the most fascinating ones. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about a book called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat before, but uh, it's written by, and it's a kind of a classic book that's often referred to, it's written by a neurologist known as Oliver Sacks. And uh, in that book, he describes many different case histories and case stories of some of his patients. And I think those stories really illustrate really well how fascinating system nervous system is and how complex brain really is. And one of the cases that he discusses about is actually a patient that he refers as Dr. P. And it's very common for us in a clinical setting to use a first letter of the name or first letter of the first name and first letter of the last name to identify patients. We don't want to give patients details away, but we want to have some consistency when we're talking about different patients. So that's not uncommon practice. And this Dr. P is a, it was an incredibly smart person, obviously having gotten a doctorate, having working on those, those fields, but he ended up uh, with occipital lobe damage and some damage also to the temporal lobe. And as a result of that, he suffered from something known as visual agnosia. Uh, that means that he had an impaired recognition of visually presented objects. And the big thing to notice here is that there was nothing wrong with her, with his vision or his intelligence. What, where the issue happened was that somewhere along the way, when those visual input was entering to the brain, the recognition of what he was seeing was not processing the way that it does for most of the people. And this particular patient, Dr. P, when he looked at his wife that he had known for many, 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 many years, they had a life together, they had shared a life together, what he saw was a hat. And he actually really tried to put his wife on a hat shelf in more than just one occasion, which I think that shows really how brain, when it works, how amazing it is. And when there's things that don't quite happen the way we normally would expect, uh, then then it's, it's really revealing to us about how well things happen normally. So that was the man who mistook his wife for a hat. The other famous Gage, uh, case that many of the students often have heard is the case of Phineas Gage, with, who was an American railroad construction foreman. And when he was working on, with the black powder, back on those days, you drilled a hole to the rock and then filled it with black powder and exploded that uh, to kind of clear up uh, terrain for the uh, railroad to be laid on or the tracks to be laid on. And when he was doing that, one of the methods that they use is to push the black powder into that hole with a metal rod. And it just happened that that metal rod, when it would hit the rock, created a spark and explosion happened. And as a result, that metal rod that he was using flew through his head, through his skull and through his brain, destroying the left frontal lobe of the brain. 
Uh, Phineas Gage actually survived this. He lived for another 12 years, but what happened? His entire personality and behavior had changed as a result of this accent, accident. So a lot of his friends said, uh, and this is a quote from one of them, that he was no longer the Gage that they knew. So it again shows that there's something so powerful, something so unique, your personality, your unique characteristic, what makes you you is coded into your nervous system. So it's, it's going to be a great couple of weeks that we'll wrap up this semester by looking at this system. So from those examples, let's move on to have a look of a little bit more uh, what is a nervous system? A nervous system is really our second communication system. A uh, nervous system uses electrical impulses that travel through the neurons. So you often can think of neurons if you make a really gross analog is like almost like electrical wires that carry signals from one body part to another part. But in addition to those electrical signals, there's other types of sign signals that also travel in the nervous system. And that's where these neurons end and join to another neuron or where there's neurons end and join to a muscle or to another organ or somewhere else. That message doesn't continue anymore as an electrical impulse. It actually passes through a small physical gap. There's nothing in between, and it passes in a chemical format across these small gaps. So nervous system is really a mixture of electrical and chemical signals. What's really characteristic for the nervous system is that the messages in the nervous system are very, very fast. Messages pass in milliseconds. Uh, from one body part to another body part. And these messages are also very, very specific. They go from one part to another. Uh, so we can be very, very clear. We can direct these messages to exactly where we want them to go. So typically we see almost immediate responses or changes or reactions uh, that we can do with nervous system. This other communication system, in addition to the nervous system that we have in the body, is going to be endocrine system. And your Bio 202 class will start by us spending time discussing endocrine system. Endocrine system is all about hormones, and hormones as well pass messages from one body part to another. But they are actually much, much, much slower in a way that they travel through the body because they travel release to the uh, bloodstream. They're also not as specific. They travel to hormones, travel to all parts of the body. And even though we have some hormones that elect immediate responses, some of the hormones can stick around for weeks, if not even months in your body. So very different ways of acting and communicating in body, but both aim to pass messages from body parts to the other body parts. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, tying this system into other systems part. Uh, if we look at the nervous system, nervous system really has typically we can identify three different functions for it. Uh, so first of all, nervous system is used to collect sensory information, so gather information from our sensory organs. And this can be from external state, but it can be also of our internal state as well. We're constantly collecting information through our different sensory organs, smell, taste, sight, hearing, balance, touch, body position, and so on and so on. But just collecting information and passing it onwards is not enough. That information has to go somewhere and where that information goes is typically to our brain. Some of the information can be processed also at the level of spinal cord and we'll see that when we talk about reflexes. But this integration giving meanings to the information that we're collecting, uh, processing it, interpreting that information is an important task, an important role of the nervous system. And more often than not, there is typically a third step to this process that we have some kind of a response to the information. And often this might be, for example, a motor output. So we have effectors, and these could be, for example, muscles, but they could be as well glands that cause some kind of a response 
to the sensory input that we received and processed, so we act on it. So those are typically how we divide the three different functions of the nervous system. Nervous system can be divided in many different ways, uh, but I often think that this is a good starting point, and this actually brings us back to a diagram that you might recognize from what we've discussed earlier on this semester. This diagram shows us our homeostasis, so how we maintain consistent internal environment, how we maintain equilibrium in the body. So we had a stimulus, we had a sensor or detector that sensed it, passed the message to the control center, which was our brain, where we typically have a set point, which is the normal range of values for the stimulus, and if necessary, that effector is recruited. Uh, most of the time in homeostasis, we stop these stimuluses from happening, but there are a few times when we also promote those to happen. So you'll see that these very basic concepts that we started the semester with come up time and time and time again. And I actually use the homeostatic mechanism loop to explain very, very con complex concepts uh, such as fluid regulation in the body once we get to the talk about how kidneys work or how kidneys play a role in a whole body system, uh, how hormones work, so on and so on. So uh, it just really is hopefully making you see that there is a bigger plan behind these classes. So, like I said, there's many ways of dividing nervous system into different portions. And one of the ways to do that is to divide nervous system into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Our focus for the second chapter this week is the central nervous system. And with central nervous system, I'm really talking about the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, often how students think of the central nervous system is to think of it as a kind of the computing or processing part. Uh, typically, central nervous system, uh, well, in humans it is, uh, it is located at the dorsal side of the body, so at the back side of the body, uh, and it really plays important role in that integration and control of processes. The second part, which we'll look at next week, our peripheral nervous system instead, that contains all of those nerves that extend outside from the brain, outside from the spinal cord. Also, your sensory organs could be grouped into this group. These you can think of sometimes how my students describe them is like as communication lines or antennas and receivers of the messages. So these are located outside the central nervous system. The spinal nerves and cranial nerves would be our big focus of attention on, on this part of the uh, nervous system. We also can do another division for the nervous system, and I sometimes see this being used, that we divide the nervous system into sensory and motor portion. So sensory portion often refers that we're doing um, kind of collecting of information and bringing it into the central nervous system. So these are afferent messages. And by afferent, I mean messages that are heading towards the central nervous system. Um, we also can do kind of a division into efferent messages, messages that are leaving the central nervous system and traveling to other parts of the body. Often these are motor impulses uh, from the central nervous system, from the brain to the effector organs. Uh, other divisions that I sometimes see being discussed when we discuss about peripheral nervous system is the division to the somatic and autonomic nervous system. So somatic responses are voluntary responses such as movements and actions. Autonomic ones are involuntary ones. We don't have control over them. They're mostly unconscious and that would include, for example, our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. 
And having mentioned those, I'm just going to kind of introduce them quickly at this point. So the division of the autonomic nervous system to sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system is sometimes something that students find useful to know. Uh, when we talk about sympathetic nervous system, one of the kind of rules of thumb that some students have used to describe it is this description of, as a fight or flight responses. So we're talking that's uh, when we talk about sympathetic nervous system is that the individual is in stressful situations. They're in situations where they really are either having to make a choice that to deal with that stress, uh, they have to face it head on. So it could be a stress of a threat to your well-being. They have to engage into a fight or they have to escape from that situation. So they fly that, that uh, dangerous situation. So we're seeing things that sympathetic nervous system is active when we have things like excitement for things, fear, anger, embarrassment, things like that. And we see certain physiological changes throughout the entire body when this branch is activated, such as elevated heart rate, breathing rate, respiratory system in general, the bronchi dilate so we can get more air in to the pre, uh, respiratory system. Digestive system instead gets pushed down. Digestive system is not activated when the sympathetic nervous system branch of autonomic nervous system is active. And this is because really we're not worried about digesting food. We're fighting for our survival. Uh, blood vessels, another example would be during activation on sympathetic nervous system. They dilate. We're directing blood to the big muscles, skeletal muscles that you just learned to either fight or flight the situation. Parasympathetic nervous system instead is something that I often describe to my students as think of how you felt after you had your Thanksgiving meal. So this is activated when we have these so-called rest and digest responses. So when we're not really fighting for survival, we can just focus on building on the body, uh, allocating resources for recovery, fixing of things, growth, things like that. So um, in these paras when parasympathetic nervous system is active, your pupils typically are constricted, heart rate low, breathing rate, blood pressure low. Um, your digestive system instead is very active. So we're focusing on extracting nutrients and energy from your gut. Uh, saliva production might be higher as well. Your urinary system uh, also is working harder when your parasympathetic nervous system is uh, active, uh, feces are being produced and so on. So this is really the time to chill and uh, kind of focus on those maintenance functions. So what I wanted to do now that we've had a kind of a sample of what nervous system is and what's to come, I wanted to talk a little bit about a neuron. A uh, neuron is the structure that's going to be important for us uh, because it's really the basic building block of the nervous system. And there's many different kinds of neurons. Typically, we teach you this overly simplified kind of a schematic uh, idea of what a typical neuron would look like. But in all reality, uh, neurons really are highly varied. So we just teach you kind of a general one that you can then utilize further. So let me just jump and I think I need to make sure that I have this slide on. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what a neuron is before we go where, where the projector was going to go next. So let's sketch together a typical neuron. Typical neuron, uh, it is a cell as any other cell that we have, but it's specialized for the purposes of nervous system. But just like any other cell, it will have a cell mass, it will have a nucleus there, and typically we have these little outgrowths coming out of that cell, and these outgrowths uh, have extensions that kind of connect whether it's to the other nerve cells or whether it's uh, like little antennas that collect information from elsewhere in the body. 
and we call these parts our dendrites. So dendrites are responsible for bringing information into the nerve cell, gathering that information. So uh, that's the first part to notice. And notice how this information is coming into the cell body, where we can do all kinds of analysis of that information, calculations, actions, adding up together. That is it word of reacting to this information that we're receiving, or is it something that is not enough to trigger a response? So dendrites and the cell body are the parts that we're seeing here. Uh, in addition, typical schematic diagram of a neuron will present you a long a kind of a tube that comes out of that neuron. This is going to be our axon. So axon is carrying the electrical impulse. If it's deemed within the cell body, within the nucleus, then yes, we should react to that info information that we're getting from the dendrite. Then uh, electrical impulse is uh, initiated and passes along the axon. Um, an axon uh, has an ending to it as well. And, and we call these endings of the axon axon terminals, and they can vary quite a bit based on different nerve cells. But let's add that here. Our axon terminal. And we might have that this action terminal joins to another nerve cell. So there would be a synapsis, a space between these nerve cells where this information traveled in a chemical format, like I mentioned, uh, between these two separate nerve cells. Sometimes we also see that these actions have branches that leave from the main axon or the axon can divide into multiple branches. These could be our collateral branches. Um, another thing that we often include to these diagrams when we're talking about neurons and this generic structure of a neuron is that we notice that sometimes these axons, and I'm just coloring it in to make it a little bit more interesting, sometimes these axons have a special adaptation that around them there's a myelin cell, uh, this kind of fatty-like structure that has built up there. So we can add this myelin around the axon as well. Not all nerve cells will have but some will, and typically these develop into these kind of like blobs of fatty material. And we'll have a look of what's the function of the myelin in a little bit, but uh, often many diagrams represent the myelin as such. So we can add that there as well. So uh, those would be some of the key parts of the neuron that I wanted to show to you. And uh, we will end up seeing that these drawings often represent these parts, but there's a lot more uh, to the neurons and they're much more varied. This is just an introduction. So we're kind of doing generalizations and the most important characteristics, but in all reality, uh, neurons are much more complex. Having said that, not all of your nervous system is just going to be neurons. Not all of it is going to be these nerve cells. In addition to the neurons, we also have cells that are known as glial cells or neuroglia. These are supporting cells that we find for our nervous system. And I want to talk about them really quickly. I know that we're kind of uh, always fighting against the clock, so I'm going to keep it simple and you can fill in more information later from the material. But I want to mention four glial cell types. And let's start with astrocytes. 
Astrocytes are these kind of star-shaped cells that support neurons in their function. So really the name astro refers to the star shape of these cells. And these play an important role in things like uh, metabolic, uh, pro providing metabolic support for the uh, neural cells. Uh, they can also make myelin and things like that. Uh, the second glial cell type that I wanted to mention real quickly is going to be our oligodendrocytes. So give me a moment to write that. And with oligodendrocytes, what we see is these cells often are around these axons, so I'm drawing an axon there, and they secrete and produce this myelin that we then have around the axon there. So they're responsible for making that myelin for the nerve cell that we just saw. So let's add that to our list of glial cells that are going to be important for us to know. So here the, it's produced this myelin around the uh, axon that I had sketched there. Another glial cell type that we sometimes see is known as microglia. And microglia are small, as the name suggests. They're really tiny cells. Uh, often they're described as looking a little bit like spiders. Um, they are our phagocytotic cells. So um, you might see that term being used regarding them as well. Uh, really, really tiny structures. So they help with, with uh, for example, removing material that we shouldn't have and so on. The final cell type of neuroglia that I wanted to mention, and uh, let me write that there. It's sometimes called ependuma cells or ependumal cells. These are cells that we typically find lining cavities in the nervous system. Uh, so they are kind of forming these boundaries and they have cilia that I've kind of stretched those sketched there, those tiny uh, outwards projections on their surface as well. And all of these glial cells and neuroglia are really, really important part of the nervous system. And I think that for a long time, we've invested a tremendous amount of energy on learning about neurons and nerve cells and kind of ignored these glial cells, supporting cells. And now we're finding that many diseases, such as Alzheimer's uh, disease, are actually more to do with these glial cells. So our understanding on that field is expanding drastically. Uh, so I was going to say earlier on about these nerve cells. So now that we have an idea what we're seeing here, we can actually measure the electrical currents inside the nerve cell. How we do that is that we take a very, very sharp, typically glass tipped object and stick it into the axon of the neuron so that it gets in there but doesn't puncture through it. And we compare the electrical current inside that axon to the electrical current outside the nerve cell. And we end up finding that there's a resting potential that's negative 70 millivolts in most uh, nerve cells present at all times. Well, you might wonder why does this matter and why is this important? Let's have a look of that. So this negative 70 millivolts is something that we have thanks to the pumps that move different electrically charged particles uh, across 
this membrane that forms are the surrounding or the outside boundaries of the nerve cell. And uh, we need this negative 70 because when that electrical impulse that I said that we had, we passed messages along the nervous system and nerves as electrical pulses. When that happens, we're seeing a change in the electrical charge inside the cell. So what you're seeing on this picture is actually us looking at a single one spot of a neuron. Obviously, you would have to follow as the electrical impulse travels through the entire distance of the axon of the neuron. We're simply looking at one spot at one time. So remember that this is kind of an oversimplification. So this resting potential is what we have when nerve cell is at rest. It's not doing anything. It's just this negative 70 millivolts that's maintained by actively pumping materials in and out of the nerve cell. However, when there is a trigger that lets now pass an electrical message along this axon, what happens? There's a drastic change, uh, and this drastic change is uh, accomplished by uh, our sodium channels opening, and the sodium now rushes into the cell and changes the electrical charge inside the cell close to zero and a little bit over zero. Um, values. So we call this depolarization. What I mean by that is that often an easy way to think of that is that when we have people who are in a polar opposites, let's say on a political spectrum, they're far away from each other. So depolarization is coming to the middle. So it's coming close to that zero millivolts. And in fact, we go a little bit above that. So this stage is known as depolarization. As the nerve impulse is initiated with the stimulus and sodium channels open and sodium rushes in, uh, so we kind of get this uh, positive charge inside the nerve cell. Now, uh, what we end up finding is that we can't keep maintaining this situation forever uh, and sodium channels close and potassium channels open uh, to normalize this charge and we're doing something known as repolarization. So the electrical charge inside the neuron returns back to normal. We talk about repolarization and you will notice that often we do go actually a little bit below that 70 millivolts. This is known as hyperpolarization. So we go lower so than what we normally have for the resting potential. And often this hyperpolarization is something that we find as a kind of a refractory period during which another action potential can't pass. So we're making certain we have time to recover from the previous electrical impulse that passed. And once we return to the resting potential, we're ready for the next uh, signal to come. So this is a really kind of a simplified description of what happens, but uh, it will be supplemented with the information that you learn on the recorded lecture videos. But those are the basic steps and these basic steps when we're looking at the electrical changes in one spot of an axon are known as an action potential. So this is how the signals travel along the uh, ac uh, axon of a nerve cell. So really these changes in the materials crossing across the, uh, in, uh, the um, cell membrane of the uh, axon is what causes this change in the electrical charges and the message passes kind of along that axon. Now, I mentioned earlier on that sometimes we also have myelin wrapped around these axons. This myelin serves kind of a twofold purpose. It's a little bit like an insulation there as well. But importantly, whenever you have myelin around the action, it actually speeds up these electrical impulses to travel along the axon. So rather than electrical impulse moving along this action at the steady rate, the electrical impulse almost like jumps from one myelin cell to another, from one gap to another. So it's able to move much quicker thanks to this. Um, so we end up seeing that myelinated axons are really fast at carrying messages. 
And the final thing that I wanted to mention regarding this chapter is this really ending of an axon at the axon terminal. So here we're seeing a couple of axons coming in and they end up in the axon terminal. And here's the next cell that we're seeing. Uh, this is an electron microscope image that has been colored. So we're seeing axon that's before this synapsis, before this gap between the two nerve cells. So we call it presynaptic neuron and then we're going to have post synaptic neuron which on the which is on the other side of the synapses and the synapses is this physical space between these two cells so there's not direct connection from action terminal to the next cell there's a small gap and it is within this small gap where the chemicals travel to move the message from one cell to another and that's really the big role of the synapse uh, that we're, we're seeing. Uh, typically, we do see synapses between from one neuron to another neuron, but also from one neuron to another effector cell. Uh, it can be, for example, a muscle that's being activated by a neuron. Uh, here's a little bit more schematic diagram of what happens in a synapsis. So we're seeing the axon coming in from a nerve cell here. And at the axon terminal, we have these little vesicles, these little structures that hold chemicals. And as the action potential travels there, these little chemical containing vesicles fuse with the outer wall of the axon terminal and release their contents into this gap, which was known as our synapsis. These contents, these chemicals travel to the second cell, the postsynaptic cell, and there bind to the receptors at the surface of the cell and activate another action potential or activate some kind of a change in that cell. And then that causes that cell to do whatever it's to do, whether it's a passing on a second action potential further or whether it's activating a muscle or whatever like that. So that's what I mean by a synapsis and syna uh, by the chemical messaging. So it's not just all electrical messages. I realized that we've come to the full time of our session today. Uh, it took me a little longer than I had planned. So I do still have a little bit more material to show for you from uh, the second chapter that we had a look uh, this week. But if you have to go, I totally understand it. Uh, don't feel bad, I'll keep recording and you'll be able to watch it from the recording. But uh, I will pick up the face and I will continue a little bit longer just to show a few key points from the next chapter as well. And the next chapter, the chapter 14 that we look at, really focused on the central nervous system. So on the brain, and the spinal cord that would come out of the brain. And really, I think that uh, it goes back to this, that brain is really all you are. Uh, it's this lump of fatty nervous tissue is really where your personality, memories, dreams, uh, imagination, wishes, future hopes, everything is housed. So you are unique only because of what's in your brain. And um, I guess that a good question to ask is how would we end up having a brain that we have uh, compared to the other animals? It turns out that many other animals have also a nervous system. So going from very simple animals to more complex animals, we all share that we have a nervous system. And most animals in their nervous system have some kind of a brain or similar structures uh, that represent the brain. And if we start looking at the brains of different animals, we'll see that there's similarities. There's differences, but there's similarities as well. So here we see, for example, a schematic representation of a human brain. And when we compare it to a sheep or a cat, we can still see that we have certain similar regions which have, which have been highlighted here with colored areas that we share. Just the amount of that region might be different and the location of that region and also the sophistication and complexity. So what we're seeing here is kind of an evolutionary tree. Uh, we're seeing the early forms of life. And as we've evolved, 
human brain is, as far as we know, the most evolved brain that we see. If we compare that, for example, to this chimpanzee brains, they look incredibly similar and they have incredibly similar areas of the brain. So we can learn a lot about humans by studying other animals and uh, by understanding the differences between animals, we can also understand what makes us unique as humans. In my classes, students typically end up dissecting sheep brains. Uh, we won't be able to do that remotely, but I do have a lecture video that I provided you of that. And you'll notice that there are certain differences between humans and sheep. For example, sheep don't have very large frontal cortex, which is the part where really our strategic planning, uh, executive functions, having hopes and dreams are located. So sometimes my students who own sheep are disappointed pointed that when I tell them that their sheep probably is not going to have the same amount of hopes and dreams and wishes as we as humans have simply because of their brain structure. But um, I think that doing those comparisons is really useful. I do want to quickly mention also about our evolutionary history. We look, uh, if we look at the development of the human species and where we are now and where we started, one of things that we end up noticing is that over the past 3 million years, the human skull grew significantly larger and the size of the brain housed within that skull uh, also grew. And, and the biggest changes that we're seeing on the brain over the evolution is really the anterior portion, so the frontal lobe growing. And in addition to that, uh, our brain early on in the evolution was very smooth surface, but whereas human brain is very crumbled from the surface. Uh, so this is a way how we were able to fit in more surface area. If I take, for example, this issue paper and we look at that it has a certain uh, surface area, how can we pack as much surface area in a small space as we possibly could? That would be by crumbling it up. So that's literally what we did with the brain in an evolutionary sense. We wanted to have a lot of surface area of the brain because that's where certain processes happen. So we generated these folds and knocks and grannies on that, uh, these, these little bumps that give us a maximum amount of surface area in a smallest possible space uh, that we can have. So those were the two big changes that we've seen in the development of the human species, growth of the brain, growth of the anterior portion of the brain, and having these folds present. So I guess that the sec is next question would be what happens during a lifetime of an individual where your brain will always keep growing. Uh, it is one of the first systems to start developing from week two onwards um, during your development. And there's a huge amount of growth in terms of the uh, rate of growth during the prenatal development and early in the life. Then it, the development does slow down, but it never stops. So your brain will keep developing throughout your life. Um, if we are looking at the development of the brain, and there's a lot of information on this slide, I'm just kind of wanting to highlight that the neural tube portion there. Uh, one of the first things that we see in a developing individual, whether it's a human or whether it's other species, is typically formation of something that we know as a neural tube. These are early nerve cells that develop and they literally take a shape of looking a little bit like a tube or a stick. And then slowly different parts of this neural tube start expanding and folding and specializing. So this is what we're seeing here five weeks after fertilization, after the egg cell met the sperm, we're already seeing specific parts of what will become a brain starting to take shape on this early initial neural tube. And pay attention to these colored areas, how they, uh, as the brain develops, find their place, find their shape, and start to resemble structures that we know of the human nervous system, central nervous system. So this is what we're seeing at the week 13, and finally at the birth. So we're seeing these same structures, but they progress 
and the bulb, different folds, different thickening, different regions, uh, the globe. And um, brain grows much faster than the skull, so that's why it must fold kind of around itself to fit in to the space that it has available. Uh, adult brain really has four parts that I want us to focus on. We have cerebral hemispheres. These are the big parts, what we see outside, what we often think of, these kind of sausage-looking structures when we talk about the brain. In addition to that, we have something known as diacephalon, which is the parts inside, the kind of middle of the brain. We also have our brainstem. Uh, this is actually the first part of the brain to develop and really houses some of the most important functions, such as your respiratory centers, regulation of that heart rate regulation, and so on. And then we have our cerebellum. Cerebellum is uh, literally means little brain. Uh, it's located at the back, and it has also specific important functions. We'll go through these real fast. I Like I said, I realize I'm over time, so again, if you need to go, uh, I totally understand, but I'm going to try to wrap up this real soon. Uh, but before we talk about those different parts, I wanted to highlight the difference between gray and white matter in the nervous system. So when we're talking about gray matter, that's really where the cell bodies of these neurons, these nerve cells that we discussed about, are typically located. And on the brain, here you're seeing a cross-section of the brain, the gray matter is typically located at the surface of the brain. So this is why we needed to generate these folds to have as much of this surface area where we can pack cell bodies of the neurons. The white matter instead is typically mostly made of myelinated accents. So the myelin, this fatty material around those actions, literally gives it a little bit wider appearance. So these are parts that carry messages and signals from one part of the brain to another part of the brain. Interestingly, if we look at that, we see on the human brain that the outer part, the cortex typically is gray matter and the inner part is white matter. This is flipped the other way around when we look at a, a spinal cord. So on the spinal cord, the cell bodies are located at the center of the spinal cord and the outer parts are made of white matter. So that's kind of interesting. So I don't know how many of you read books like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, on Sherlock Holmes, they always say, talk about how he has to go and dig in his gray matter. So that really means that he's doing thinking. He's activating these cell bodies of his cortex of his brain. So uh, I think that sometimes we think that, that the thinking happens on this portion. Uh, it's not quite as simple, but that's one way to think. Other thing that I wanted to mention was to mention the fact that there's empty spaces inside the brain. So I've highlighted them on the blue color here. And these empty spaces contain a fluid. And this fluid is known as our cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. And uh, these empty spaces are what we know as ventricles of the brain. Uh, these are lined by those ependymal cells that we saw earlier on. So uh, I think that that's kind of interesting as well to note. I promised to you that we would go through the four main parts of the brain real fast. So kind of picking up on that, uh, let's talk about cerebral hemispheres. These represent approximately 83% of the total brain mass. And some of the terminology to keep on mind when we talk about those um, when we talk about guri, we, guri, we talk about riches or these bumps. Uh, so this is kind of like an uh, enlargement of the surface. So guri are these bumps, sulci are these depressions instead on the surface, uh, kind of grooves on the surface of the brain. And then whenever we have fissures, they're really, really, really deep depressions, uh, very prominent grooves that we can see. And let's have a look of two fissures that we can see here. 
So we can see longitudinal fissures separating the right and left side of your cerebral hemispheres. Uh, so that's a big typical longitudinal fissure that we use as a landmark. We also have transverse fissure, which separates the cerebrum and cerebellum. So these two parts of the brain as well from each other. So this one would be the transverse, whereas this one was the longitudinal one. We can also identify different parts of the uh, cerebral hemispheres. So let's have a look of that. And these different parts are separated by important sulci, kind of there are land, uh, landmarks for separating different regions of the brain. So let's do just that and have a look of these different areas that I mentioned. So this is would be the front of the head, this would be the back of the head, the top and bottom, and you would have a spinal cord coming out from here. So the very front part, the anterior portion of the brain, is dedicated by the frontal uh, lobe of the brain. So you remember you had frontal bone of the skull, underneath that is going to be frontal lobe of the brain. Um, really, the frontal lobe does many important things, like I said, thinking, planning, executive functions are housed within this area. So that's the part that's especially developed in humans when we compare it to other species. Uh, at the kind of uh, back of the frontal lobe, we also find a mo lot of motor areas located here. Uh, the parietal lobe instead is located underneath the front uh, parietal bone and this is where really sensory functions are largely located we also will see occipital lobe which is at the back this is where vision processing happens so literally i often talk to my students when you see cartoons where someone falls and hits the back of their head and they see stars that would be because their vision region is impacted. Obviously, your eyes are at the front and the messages get passed through the brain, but this is where we really get meanings and process those visual stimuli. Uh, and finally, we have our temporal lobe, which is located kind of on the side where uh, this is where your language functions, hearing, speech, uh, or things like that are produced. You will have deep, kind of deeper in, also an area known as insula. Um, here are the lobes that we just discussed, and uh, like I said, we've learned a lot about what these different lobes do by accidents from individuals who have had injuries on different areas of these lobes. We can then learn what they do. We also can do brain imaging nowadays. Functional MRI is a big one. Also, during surgeries by touching different areas, we can then learn from the patient what they experience. There's two areas that I wanted to highlight, uh, really, uh, when we talk about uh, Broca's area, which is important for speech production, and Wernicke's area, which is really important for uh, comprehension of the speech. So we see that even though we have these specific areas, sometimes we have overlap of many things. So such as motor regions from the parietal lobe in collaboration with the temporal lobes, language functions are needed to kind of process as speech, understand it, and so on. Um, I wanted to mention a few words really quickly about the diencephalon, this part inside the brain, uh, and we'll also then see the brain stem. So diencephalon is divided into three parts itself. Um, we will see thalamus, we will see hypothalamus, and we will see epithalamus. So really quickly to kind of give you an idea about the thalamus, this is this kind of an egg-shaped blob on both sides of the brain. Uh, really, this is where fibers communicate with the cerebral cortex. Uh, this is often a relay station for information coming to the cortex. Uh, it kind of edits, sorts, relays uh, information, things like emotions, visceral functions, direct motor functions, memory and sensory integration to create those whole experiences often are involved with the thalamus. 
hypothalamus instead uh, is literally the name proposes it's beneath below the thalamus uh, things like for example smell relay station is located here and it's connected to pituitary gland which is going to be an important gland when you study your endocrine system on your bio 202 um, with the hypothalamus uh, this is really a regulation center for much of the homeostatic uh, processes such as blood pressure, heart rate, digestive tract, pupil size, things like that. Uh, physical responses to emotions are associated with this area, regulating body temperature, so sweating, shivering, things like that, hunger, feeling full, thirst, sleep, wake cycle, endocrine control uh, is largely through the hypothalamus. And finally, the epithalamus, I wanted to mention about that, and especially the pineal gland. Pineal gland is important for producing melatonin, which is really important for sleep-wake cycle regulation. And you'll get to learn all about that when you do your Bio 202 class. Continuing on our journey of the brain, let's mention a few words about the brainstem. So we have uh, three different parts for that. We have our midbrain, which is inside the brain. We have our pons, which is the first kind of a blob. And then we have our medulla oblongata, often called medulla. Um, they are uh, kind of continued then as a spinal cord, contain very vital functions. Again, midbrain, I would often describe it as kind of a relay station, whereas pons, for example, regulates breathing rhythm. And with the medulla, we see things like equilibrium relay, uh, reflexes, heart rate, blood vessel, diameter regulation, breathing cycle, things like hiccup, vomiting, swallowing, coughing, sneezing uh, related to there. And the final part of the brain is, that we're going to look at is going to be our cerebellum. This literally means a little brain. Uh, it represents about 11% of the brain mass. And this is where movement and balance coordination is happening, happening largely. If we cut cerebellum in half, we'll see this uh, structure where we have these white tracks running in there. Uh, early anatomists looked at them and said, but doesn't it look a little bit like a tree? And that's where the name arbor vitae came from. Uh, literally, arbor vitae means in Latin tree of life. So if you look the cross section. Uh, I think that that's where I was going to finish the review. I know, like I said, that I went over the timeline. So I'm going to propose that we're not going to do a review of the homework today. We'll just leave it for uh, if you have questions, I'll be always happy to make the time and work with you individually. Uh, and this would be the time if you have any questions that I'd be very, very happy to help with those. Uh, if you don't have any questions, that's all I have for tonight. Uh, I will post this as a recording. I know that we went through a lot of material kind of fast. Uh, like I said, you're very, very, well, very welcome to join us for the field trip on the coming Tuesday at 8 a.m. at Williams campus. Uh, but please know that it's not required. It's not expected. It's just something that some students enjoy getting a chance to see. And you're very, very welcome to come along. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll stick around. If you don't, this is it for today. Uh, I really appreciate you and hope you have a wonderful night as well. Enjoy your evening, both of you. <laughs>
On that note, uh, I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. Uh, remember, I'm available for you in multiple ways. Uh, you can always join me for the office hours, Monday to Wednesday, uh, every day from 1 o'clock till 3. I'm available in the WebEx uh, during these live online sessions on Thursday evenings at 8 o'clock. And uh, true messages, I ask you that you try to use Canvas. I'm quickest to get hold of there. Um, if you drop me a message, we can also find a time that works for both of us outside those times. So that's really all I have for today. Once again, thank you so much. I appreciate you. I appreciate the fantastic work that so many of you are doing. And remember, I am here to help you. I really want you to succeed on this class. So drop me a message if there's anything that I can do. Uh, I look forward to seeing some of you on Tuesday uh, if you're able to come. Uh, but again, no stress and no pressure if you are not. Uh, have a very good rest of the week and uh, enjoy a little bit calmer week. Uh, I know last week was very, very intense and very fast. So hopefully it will be a nice uh, change of face and chance for you to have a little bit of a breather. Um, thank you again and have a good night.